Hey everyone, we know how hard it can be to keep up with the latest news in Israel, so if you haven't had the time to stay on top of what's what in the Holy Land, have no worries. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and this is ILTV's Weekly Review. Israel has been experiencing some unusually strong weather, and to start the show off today, we have ILTV's Shanna Fold on the street with a little taste of what it's like. How's it out there, Shanna? Yes, Natasha, we've been dealing with some extreme weather out here. Last night, I can tell you, I was nearly knocked off of my feet from the wind, and the rain was extremely strong. I'm not the only one who struggled, though. Let's take a look at some of these shocking videos from Israelis who suffered all throughout the country. Now, the Israeli military has just carried out airstrikes in Gaza after rocket fire from the coastal enclave into Israel forced the Israeli prime minister to take cover with dozens of others. Let's look at the chaos that erupted last night as Prime Minister Netanyahu was campaigning for today's Likud leadership primary. The premier was rushed off stage to take cover for the second time in under four months after Palestinian terrorists launched a rocket toward the Israeli city of Ashkelon. The Iron Dome missile defense system managed to shoot down the incoming missile and no injuries have been reported. In most cases, Israeli leaders refrained from announcing their visits to the area surrounding the Gaza Strip. But this time around, Netanyahu clearly publicized his upcoming visit. <laughs> Now, Israeli warplanes have just struck several Hamas targets in the Gaza Strip in response to the rocket fire, including a so-called resistance site in northern Gaza. No Palestinian group is claiming responsibility for Wednesday's attack, but sporadic rocket launches and attempted breaches into Israel over the last week have disrupted the Egyptian-brokered ceasefire that ended two days of fighting back in November. After last night's rocket attack, the Israeli prime minister came back on stage after 15 minutes to tell the crowd, the person who fired the rocket last time is no longer with us, and the person who did it this time should start packing their things. The Israeli military holds Hamas responsible for any violence that emanates from the Gaza Strip. Well, the IDF chief of staff is now warning Israelis that the next war that Israel faces with Iran could be disastrous, and that's all because Israel is alone in the fight against the Islamic Republic. Aviv Kochavi is stressing that Israel is now ready and willing to go after every nation sponsoring anti-Israel terrorism. כל מה שתומך טרור, כל מה שמאפשר לטרור להתקיים, לפעול ולפגע נגדנו, חשמל, דלק, צירים, אנחנו נתקוף. תדע המדינה שמארחת את ארגון הטרור, שמאפשרת לארגון הטרור, או שאפילו מעודדת את ארגון הטרור הזה, תדע שהיא נושאת באחריות. האחריות היא של ממשלת לבנון, האחריות היא של חמאס, האחריות היא של סוריה, ואני לא רוצה למנות את כל שאר המדינות. This is the first major speech that the IDF chief of staff has given since taking the helm, and he says that Israelis must mentally prepare themselves, that heavy fire will be directed against the state of Israel once the IDF strikes Iranian positions more aggressively. And it's because of the fact that Israel will be forced to strike urban areas as a result of Iran's policy of using its own citizens as human shields. When we say there, it's not only that he chose to be there, but that from there he will be able to get a lot of tiles and rockets on the people of the United States. Let's stop this. All right, moving on to harder news. The Israeli Prime Minister has just revealed plans to build 3,000 new residential and industrial units in Judea and Samaria, or the West Bank. And the announcement comes on the eve of the Likud Party primaries, which are scheduled for tomorrow. ILTV's Shanna Fold has the scoop. 
The Israeli Prime Minister has just revealed plans to build 3,000 new residential and industrial units in Judea and Samaria, or the West Bank. The announcement comes on the eve of the Likud party primaries, which are scheduled for tomorrow. Since the beginning of his campaign for general elections, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu has made the settlements a central issue. Just ahead of the September election, Netanyahu vowed to annex the Jordan Valley immediately upon the formation of a government coalition. But now Israel is headed to third elections, and that plan is being frozen until further notice. The construction of 3,000 new homes that Netanyahu is now promising must be brought before the High Court for approval within two weeks. Building permits and settlements in Judea and Samaria have increased by 50% over the past five years. The growth is believed to be connected to U.S. President Donald Trump's softer stance on the issue. Just last month, the U.S. reversed a previous policy stance, announcing that Israeli settlements in Judea and Samaria are not illegal. Critics say increasing settlement activity is detrimental to the future of an Israeli-Palestinian peace deal, but the Israeli Prime Minister is voting to extend Israeli sovereignty in the West Bank. All right, 26-year-old Nama Isakhal is still behind bars in Russia, and she's appealing to the courts for the second time. The Israeli-American has been held in Russia since April when she was stopped in the Moscow airport for having a handful of marijuana in her checked luggage. Isakhal had been passing through during a layover from India to Israel at the time, and she's now up against a seven-and-a-half-year prison sentence and refuses to believe that this is her fate. She's now appealing to a higher court after the first panel of judges discussed her case for 20 minutes and ruled against her with a one-sentence statement. In Isakhal's hearing, she told judges she had no intention of bringing drugs into Russia and had not even passed customs control when she was stopped. She also stated that she did not understand a written confession she signed because it was in Russian. Now, many suspect that Isakhal's imprisonment is politically motivated since the amount of marijuana in question usually calls for a slap on the wrist in the Russian legal system. Russia had tried to exchange Isakhal for Alexei Bulkov, a Russian hacker allegedly involved in a huge American credit card scheme. At the time, Bulkov had been held in Israeli custody, but Israel decided to comply with the American request to extradite him to the United States back in November for eventual trial. The Israeli government has just announced that it will be classifying its, del its deliberations about the International Criminal Court's upcoming investigation into alleged war crimes in the Palestinian territories. This comes after even more Israeli outrage following reports that the ICC allegedly avoided meeting with Israeli organizations before announcing the probe, but did in fact meet with Palestinian groups several times. <laughs> התבשרנו שגזרות חדשות מוטלות על העם היהודי. גזרות אנטישמיות של בית הדין הבינלאומי, שבא ואומר לנו היהודים שעומדים פה ליד הקיר הזה, ליד ההר הזה, בעיר הזאת, בארץ הזאת, שאין לנו זכות לחיות פה, ושאם אנחנו חיים פה אנחנו מבצעים פשע מלחמה. אנטישמיות לשמה. אנחנו לא נרכין ראש מול העוולה הזאת, מול האבסורד הזה, ואנחנו נילחם בה בכל הכלים. That's what Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu had to say following the International Criminal Court's announcement. The probe will look into Israel's policy of Jewish settlement in Judea and Samaria or the West Bank, the 2014 Gaza War, and the Israeli response to violent Palestinian protests on the Gaza Strip border. The ICC says it will also be investigating Hamas's targeting of civilians and use of its own people as human shields during war. But Israeli officials are calling the entire investigation a political tool that exposes the ICC's bias against Israel. Prior to the announcement of the impending investigation, the pro-Israel International Association of Jewish Lawyers and Jurists reportedly attempted to contact ICC Chief Prosecutor Fatou Ben Souda to share legal documents fighting the case, but failed to receive any response. Yet just two weeks ago, Ben Suda allegedly met with representatives of the Palestinian Center for Human Rights. Top Israeli officials and military brass could face prosecution in this investigation, and the Israeli Foreign Ministry is now hosting a meeting to discuss how to respond to the probe. All deliberations will be classified. All right, well, it looks like the Israeli Prime Minister's plans to annex the Jordan Valley won't be happening anytime soon. Netanyahu's plans have reportedly entered a deep freeze following the International Criminal Court's decision to investigate Israeli-Palestinian war crimes in the territories. 
Just a week before the last Israeli elections on September 17th, the Israeli Prime Minister made a promise that caused an international uproar. The Jordan Valley is a part of Judea and Samaria, or the West Bank, that runs along Israel's eastern border with Jordan, or what the Prime Minister calls Israel's defense wall. And even though the annexation would be built as a security measure for the state of Israel, opponents claim it would ultimately seize land that is vital to any future Palestinian state and therefore dismantle the peace process. But the Prime Minister says that the move is a long time coming. In the last uh, three years under the Trump administration, I've been moving things that have been unimaginable. Uh, we've got the Americans to agree to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital, to move their embassy here, to recognize our sovereignty in the Golan Heights, to pull out of the, the, the dangerous Iran agreement, which Gantz and uh, Lapid support. Uh, all of that has been here. Now we're at the cusp of doing something great. Uh, I'm, uh, I've been preparing the ground for American recognition for our uh, annexation of the Jordan Valley. And indeed, I intend to apply Israeli law to all the settlements, inside the blocks, outside the blocks. Well, it doesn't look like annexation is on the table for now because the first interministerial meeting to discuss extending Israeli sovereignty over the Jordan Valley was canceled last week, just hours before it was scheduled to start. The cancellation came right after it became clear that the International Criminal Court was planning to probe Israel. The ICC says it will proceed with an investigation into crimes committed in the Palestinian territories, including Israel's settlement policy, the 2014 Gaza war, and the Israeli response to violent protests on the Gaza Strip border. Hamas will be probed for its targeting of civilians and use of its own people as human shields during war. Israeli media is reporting that Israeli government officials fear that moving forward with the annexation of the Jordan Valley will escalate Israel's confrontation with the ICC which is why the issue will enter a so-called deep freeze. Israel is accusing the ICC of bias against Israel and anti-Semitism. All right, speaking of anti-Semitism, it's been just weeks since U.S. President Donald Trump issued an executive order to combat anti-Semitism, which grants Jewish students the same protections as other minority groups. And now that executive order is being tested. ILTV's Nittany Manson has the scoop. Jonathan Cartin is studying at Columbia University in New York City. And when he heard that a well-known professor in the Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African Studies had endorsed Hamas's military wing with impunity, he was shocked. Cartin is a Jewish Israeli American whose own uncle was kidnapped and murdered by a Hamas cell in Israel in 1996. And he says this isn't the first time that Jewish students at Columbia University have endured systematic discrimination from tenured professors and anti-Israel groups. That's why he's decided to file a federal complaint against Columbia University for anti-Semitic discrimination. His complaint has been filed by The Lawfare Project, an American nonprofit that works to protect the human and civil rights of Jewish and pro-Israel communities worldwide. A Columbia spokesperson says that the university has no formal comment on the complaint. All right, well, we are about to enter a new decade, and Israel's population has grown significantly, but we're not talking about babies, no, we're talking about immigrants. Now, to discuss the latest in the diaspora is ILTV's Shanna Fold. So, Shanna, uh, tell us a little bit about the numbers here. Okay, so a quarter of a million immigrants have come to Israel in the last 10 years, which is huge, and wow. that's from 150 different countries. 150 different countries. And and this year alone was actually one of the biggest immigration waves in the last decade as well, right? This year alone we had 34,000 immigrants come. Uh -huh. Now, 44% of the immigrants that have come to Israel since the Israel's been founded in yeah. 1948 came after 1990. Wow, and that is very interesting. Yes, and we're also having an, uh, a huge wave just within the last 10,000. Uh -huh. Okay, so... so where are these immigrants coming from? I mean, I'm assuming there are a lot of people coming from the United States, Russia. Now, when I said in the last 10,000, yeah. I meant in the last 10 years. In the last 10 in years. In the last okay. 10 years. Um, now, 44%, uh, excuse me, 67,000 came from Russia. 
Okay. We have 46,000 from Ukraine, 38,000 from France, 32,000 from the US, where I come from, right. and 10,500 from Ethiopia. Now, these are huge numbers to come yeah. in the last 10 years. Do you know why that is? Why, why they're making their way over right now in the last 10 years? Now, everyone has their different reason for needing to come to Israel or wanting to come to Israel. Some people feel very that they are Zionists and they believe in the state of Israel. Some people come because they are dealing with economic hardships. Right. Now, um, one country that I thought was very interesting and surprising was Brazil. Okay. Brazil, um, in 2014, had about 200 immigrants coming to Israel from Brazil each year. Now, since 2017, we've had 600 Brazilians come every year. So that's triple. Right. Is there a specific reason for that number? I think that when times get hard with jobs and, and people find trouble ec with economically, they say, why not just get up and, and join my people who have right. something moving forward and progressing in Israel? Yeah, well, it's very interesting because back in the day, there, there was kind of more of an ideological reason to immigrate to this country. And now we're also seeing economic benefits. Shannon, thank yes. you so much for joining You're us. You're welcome. Well, today an estimated 5.8 million Americans live with Alzheimer's disease and 205,000 have been diagnosed here in Israel. And families are desperate for a ray of hope, especially since the illness doesn't have a cure or even a treatment. Well, now there's an unsuspecting prevention method that could change the game. A vaccine originally created to treat tuberculosis and bladder cancer may actually be the cure for something else, Alzheimer's disease. Or at least that's what researchers at Hebrew University are saying after an interesting finding. They noticed that countries that had treated bladder cancer with tuberculosis vaccine, also called the BCG vaccine, had lower rates of Alzheimer's. And the research has been there all along, stretching back to the 1960s. It's just that it hadn't been properly analyzed until now. After getting the tip, researchers followed over a thousand bladder cancer patients at Hadassah Hospital here in Israel, who were being treated for bladder cancer. And with an average patient age of 68, researchers are discovering that those who did not get the vaccine were significantly more at risk for Alzheimer's. 8.9% who didn't receive the vaccine were at risk in comparison to just 2.4% who had been exposed. Now, those who had never been treated with the vaccine at all were four times as likely to develop the disease than those who had at least some exposure. Ironically, while it is tough to get a precise measurement of the impact that the vaccine has on cancer, evidence that the vaccine can prevent Alzheimer's is pretty strong. Currently, Alzheimer's disease has no cure or treatment available at all. All right, guys, speaking of the holidays, forget gold-plated coins on Hanukkah. We have a new goodie that you're going to want to keep your eye on. The Guinness World Records have just announced the world's most valuable dreidel. And yes, it is just as shiny and blingy as you'd hope. You're looking at the most valuable dreidel on the planet. Jewelers in New York City created this 18 karat gold masterpiece, which features 222 diamonds, making up the Hebrew letters Nun, Gimel, He, and Shin. And there's even a 4.2 karat diamond on its tip. Yes, you're expected to spin it on a 4.2 karat diamond. Good thing diamonds are considered the hardest gem on the planet. It may actually be scary to see what kind of damage this thing can do to your table. But anyway, the flashy dreidel is only valued at a whopping $70,000. The Estate Diamond Jewelry Showroom is behind the creation, which stands 10.8 centimeters high. And they say they wanted to create a dream dreidel inspired by the vintage jewelry from their collection. Well, I'm not sure who's willing to take the risk of spinning it, but this dreidel is certainly one way to celebrate Hanukkah. All right, the old city of Jerusalem is home to some of the most holy sites on the planet. And last week, ILTV's Emmanuel Godot showed us around the ancient Muslim quarter. Today, we're following her as she explores the Jewish quarter. Take a look. We're here right now in the Jewish quarter, which has a very rich history and is home to tons of synagogues and yeshivas. Behind us, you can find the big synagogue of the Jewish quarter, the Churva Synagogue. Jewish Quarter started to become alive again in the 13th century and uh, till today it's very vivid. Jewish people surrendered between the years 4867, it was deserted. During the 19 year period, the Jordanians had control of the city under the Israel-Jordan Armistice Agreement of 49. Some of the houses were destroyed by Jordanians in 1967. We came back and rebuilt the houses 
and also we rebuilt the synagogue that was destroyed also by Jordanian bombings. And several years ago, we finished to rebuild it, and it looks exactly like it used to be in the 19th century. When we came back in 67, it was an option for us to clear the ruins and start to dig. And when we dug, we found the Roman cardo, the one layer underneath us. 2,000 years ago, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in the year 132 and built a Roman city, and we found it. And this is the market street that goes from Damascus Gate, from the Muslim quarter, through the Jewish quarter, all the way. And at the moment, we just walked from present time 2,000 years ago. So we're walking in the Roman street, and what we see here, it's only half of the wide street that the Romans built in the middle of Jerusalem as a marketplace. And if you look at the back over there, you can see the way the Cardo used to look like in the year 132 and on. The most iconic symbol of the Jewish quarter is the Western Wall or the Kotel, which is right behind me, where you can see hundreds of people coming to pray every single day. Many people assume that the Western Wall is the holiest site for Jewish people, when in fact, it's considered holy due to its connection to the Temple Mount. The rock, under the Dome of the Rock is the most important place, the place where the Ark of Covenant was standing in the Holy of Holies in the two temples that we hear. The first temple that was destroyed in the 6th century BC by Babylonians, and the second temple that was destroyed in the year 70 by Romans. Due to the Temple Mount's entry restrictions for anyone that's not Muslim, the wall is the holiest place where Jews are permitted to pray, though the holiest site lies right behind it. People want to write something, to right. wish for something, to ask for something. It's like an ancient email to God. <laughs> I love yeah. that. The Western Wall itself stretches almost half a kilometer, but today only part of the wall is visible. If you visit the Western Wall tunnels underground, however, you can reach the segments of the wall that are hidden from view and touch the original stone. So don't miss out, because next Thursday, I'm going to be showing you the third quarter that I got to explore. That's it for ILTV's weekly review. See you next week.